It should be up. Sorry for the creepy recording. All right. So if you could uh, please let us know, uh, I think you should be able to vote whether you are uh, implementing CBS, planning to start CBS, thinking of doing CBS or not planning on doing CBS, or if you don't know. I'll just give you a small second for some mapping there. Okay, I think it says 65% have voted, but I will end it here. Okay, so it looks like uh, a lot of you are already implementing CBS or thinking of doing CBS. So that's uh, very good and it'll be very interesting to, to hear your thoughts and questions later on regarding this. Okay. Um, right, I will get started. Then can you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we can see it, but it's your notes page, Rebecca. It's my notes page. That's not very useful. Okay, what about now? Perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, so we first wanted to discuss a bit um, what CBS is and what CBS isn't, so to speak. Um, so CBS, as many of you will know, is when we train Red Cross Red Crescent volunteers to detect and report on health risks and events in their communities. So it means that we're training our volunteers to fill a gap uh, between the community and the health facility and giving them the tools to report when they see signs and symptoms that, they, um, that they've been trained on to recognize. Um, what we get a bit of is a bit of confusion about what is CBS, what is contact tracing, and what is active case finding. So I'm just doing a bit of uh, uh, cleaning up here before we get started. So contact tracing is different from community-based surveillance because in contact tracing, there are officials that identify and follow up on people who have been in contact with someone who is sick. So you are uh, trying to trace the contacts of the person who's sick, right? For active case findings, it is when community health workers or epidemiologists are systematically searching and screening uh, within target groups for people who are sick. So the difference there is that community-based surveillance is when community volunteers are detecting signs and symptoms quite often when they are out doing other community health activities. Okay. So the reason that we need CBS is because in some places, the distance between the public and the uh, health facilities is far, or there's a gap in between the two. And when there is a gap in between the two, it means that the health authorities won't necessarily know when something is going on um, health-wise or outbreak-wise. So for instance, in this community that only has five people, um, there are five people that are sick. So say that they, um, they've all contracted COVID-19. In this example, the first person dies before he or she goes to the medical facility. The second person uh, goes to a primary health care unit, so a small health unit. The third person goes to the pharmacy. The fourth person goes to a traditional healer. And then the fifth person goes to the hospital. And so the question is, how many of these people will we know is sick? Okay. So the first person, we don't know is sick because he, he or she has died. The second person, we might know if the primary health unit is reporting into a health information system at facility level. The third person who went to the pharmacy will not know about. The fourth person who went to the traditional healer will not know about. Whereas the person who went to the doctor, we will. So in this example of the five person community, we really only know about one or potentially two people that are sick. And what that means is that it allows or it creates um, 
possibility of, of outbreaks uh, spreading without us knowing about it. So one of the ways that we can fill this information gap, basically, is through CBS. And so the way that CBS and the CBS mechanism in general works is that you have a volunteer uh, in a community who's been trained and the community know that if someone is sick, I can come to this Red Cross Red Crescent volunteer and get help. So the community member here is coming to the volunteer saying my son has been sick. The volunteer would then go visit the, the sick person potentially, uh, provide some first aid and then decide whether or not he or she reports it. So they would then report it or send the alert if it matches the community case definition that they have been trained on. I'll get back to this later. So the person could report using a mobile phone, sending SMS, uh, paper-based, or making a phone call, depending on how your uh, CBS system is, is set up for reporting. So say that in this case, it's SMS reporting. The SMS would then go to a system, the system could say, thank you very much for your message and also send an alert to the volunteer's supervisor. So then the supervisor uh, will be able to know, okay, something's happening. And especially if a lot of reports are coming from the same place, they'd be able to realize that, okay, maybe there's something here. Maybe there's an outbreak. The supervisor could then inform the Ministry of Health or the health authorities who could then send a response. So what we're trying to ensure is that we're detecting potential outbreaks early, therefore responding early, uh, which then flattens the epidemic curve. So all very, all very good. Really. Mm -hmm. um, just to mention that a lot of uh, CBS programs, uh, a lot of the Norwegian Red Cross and Federation CBS programs are built into existing community health activities. So that's the bottom part of this triangle. Um, so within this, you might, in the second triangle for preparedness, train the volunteers who are already doing some sort of community health promotion, that could be ECV, CBHFA, etc., to recognize the signs and symptoms as a sort of passive preparedness means. Um, once you have that, you're, you can also scale your CBS up um, to be an emergency sort of CBS. Um, one point on uh, sort of terminology or uh, the way that we do CBS in the Red Cross Red Crescent movement is that we're not talking about disease surveillance, we're talking about health risk or events and symptomatic surveillance basically. So we're training the volunteers to recognize signs and symptoms of health risks that are linked to outbreak or epidemic prone diseases that have been decided upon with the Ministry of Health. So within each context, you might have different health risks that you're looking at um, that sort of match whichever highest risk of a specific outbreak you might have in that context. So that could be based on uh, past epidemics or scale or impact uh, that is to be decided with the Ministry of Health. Um, in most CBS projects, we also say not to do too many health risks because you need your volunteers to be able to remember them, to remember what the first aid steps are and how to report them. So in the Norwegian Red Cross projects, for instance, most volunteers will only need to remember three or four community case definitions. Um, also to mention that uh, CBS is supposed to fill a surveillance gap as well as integrate into the existing Ministry of Health system, um, either through referral pathways, that sort of thing. Um, in most of our projects, we're sharing some of the data with the Ministry of Health, uh, protecting the personal data, but sharing the data of uh, the health risks. Um, and you need to do that because we're collecting the data for a response, and that response should come from the Ministry of Health. So it's not a separate system, it's not a parallel system, and it's not only for the Red Cross, it's very much for um, your Ministry of Health. Since we're in uh, COVID times, and this webinar is very much on CBS and, and COVID, uh, I wanted to just mention this, that um, CBS in the Red Cross Red Crescent movement uh, has some defined health risks that you report on. 
Um, so Federation programs, Norwegian Red Cross programs, etc., will all use the same list of health risks. Um, and in the context of COVID-19, um, there are sort of two health risks you can use. For the Norwegian Red Cross, we use number nine. So we use uh, fever, dry cough, and difficulty breathing. That's what the volunteers are trained on. So they might report that, and it's not COVID-19, but what we want is a sensitive system that's symptomatic and not diagnostic. So um, you could also use um, cluster of unusual illnesses, that sort of thing. It, it depends on um, the context and, and what you want to train your volunteers on. Um, we also just wanted to mention um, volunteer safety during CVS, um, particularly for, for COVID-19. Uh, so there will be some sort of an additional layer in your CVS uh, for COVID-19, which uh, we can also discuss later on. Okay, I'm going to try to show you a film now of um, one way that you can do CVS which is using the, uh, the NIST platform, which is the community-based surveillance platform for the Red Cross Red Crescent movement that's been designed by Federation Norwegian Red Cross and then together with our Somali Red Crescent uh, colleagues, who we will be hearing from a bit later. But let's see if I can show you this film. Mm -hmm. This is the story of how using this helped my village. Here is my village. The nearest health facility is very far away. So when people in my community get sick, the doctors won't know about it unless it gets very bad and spreads to a lot of people. As a Red Cross Red Crescent volunteer, I have been trained to help my community when someone feels sick and to report any health risks I notice and other unusual events to the local health authorities. This is called community-based surveillance or CBS. CBS helps me and other community members fill a gap in the surveillance system. To do CBS more efficiently, we in the Red Cross Red Crescent have developed NIS a new platform that helps health authorities act faster and save lives. As a CBS volunteer, when I hear or see something unusual in my village, NIS allows me to report it right away using a simple mobile phone. I just send a short coded SMS and then I receive immediate feedback. NIS automatically analyzes all reports sent in by volunteers like me from my community and others nearby. If the reports show that a lot of people are getting sick in the same place, NIS alerts the local Red Cross Red Crescent and health authorities in real time. That way, they can respond much earlier and we can continue to take care of those in our community that need help. Early detection leads to early action, which stops outbreaks and ultimately saves lives. With this, I have a much better way of reporting health risks in my village. The authorities can act faster and with greater knowledge than before, and we can all help to save lives in our communities and beyond. No problem. I will bring hers up now. Great. Thank you. Naomi, are you ready? 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Go ahead. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Kenya Red Cross is also supporting the community-based surveillance system, working closely with the national government of Kenya. The Kenya Red Cross heavily relies on the functional systems of the Kenyan government, which we call the community health strategy, and our starting point was from that. So in Kenya, we basically have three types of surveillance. The new one is the community-based surveillance, which the National Society is trying to encourage the government to adopt. But the government has been having another system already in place called the event-based surveillance, which is the organized and rapid, which is an organized system which rapidly captures information about events that are potential risks to the public health. Information can be rumors and any other ad hoc reports transmitted, and that's what we call the evidence-based surveillance system for the government. The government also gets surveillance system for the epidemics through indicator-based surveillance. The system or the indicator-based surveillance is about reporting specific diseases to the public health officers from the facilities. The officers are able to get information from the system. The, the information can be from the rural units, that is the health facilities at the sub-county or at the national, at the county health facilities. And the information is populated at the system we call the district health information system, which keeps speaking on alarming events. Now coming back to Kenya Red Cross, we realized that the community has no voice because these are definitely the system that the government has put but if you look clearly at the definition you'll find there's no community participation so the national society supported by the federation we discussed with the government had introduced the community-based surveillance system defining how the system works as i said earlier the government has a system we call community health strategy which was initiated in the year 2006. In the year 2006, and the, the system aimed at bringing the health services nearer to the community by working under a system which we call the, whereby a, a population of 500 people were supposed to be supported by one health facility, which we call the Tier 1, and it's served by the health worker, whom we call the CHAS and the volunteers are encouraged or were encouraged to serve or to visit 20 households. So when Kenya Red Cross came in handy in 2018 after negotiating with the government, we supported the system by taking the same volunteers and introducing them to the epidemic control for volunteers and data trained them. The data trained them about the CBS. So I am the Minister of Health we are not the system of the cbs is in kenya is not competing against the government structures which is the ebs or evidence-based surveillance or indicator-based surveillance but we are rather complementing by ensuring that for sure the community voice is raised the, we always say that epidemics start with the communities and can end with the communities so if the community can be made to participate in this surveillance we thought it would work better even for the government and that's how we started by by piloting on four counties, which are three in the Rift Valley region and one in the central region of Kenya, informed by the epidemics which were there by the time. Majorly, we have so many epidemics in Kenya, which are both human in nature and others come from the animals. The four counties are majorly, the four counties majorly host communities whom we call the pastoralists. So in fact, there the are so many epidemics originating from the animals like the anthrax, the rift valley fever, rabies among others. And these are the diseases we decided we can put into the system to be part of this fairance. The human diseases are the, the acute water diarrhea, which could be cholera. And we also have the, the rabies, animal rabies, we have the 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 surveillance is harnessing six diseases that is the human diseases which as i've said the corona but for the community case definition then the volunteers are not taught to talk about the corona and so what i'm saying 
the CBS, community-based surveillance focused on six human diseases. And then the five, the four animal diseases. I want to take us back so that we can understand even how the system started. In the year 2018, at the beginning of the year, we did the orientation of the national people who are, we call them, we did the national inception meeting, targeting the higher officers so that we could have a buy-in and later cascaded this to the counties. In the year 2018, you note know, there's a timeline because we always have to use the bureaucratic system of, of the government. After we trained them as master trainers, and, and introducing the protocol, that is the community-based surveillance protocol, they bought in the idea and we decided to cascade the same to the counties. That took another four months. So in the year 2019, at the beginning of the year, we had managed to make a buy-in for all the counties. That is the four counties which were, we were to do the, 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 the trials. In the, after training them for about three days, the master trainers were able to cascade down the same training to the key persons at the county level, targeting the disease surveillance people. Remember, these are epidemic diseases. So the most important people in this were the county disease surveillance officers. We also talked of the animal diseases. So we ensured that we have informed the veterinary officers, they are key stakeholders in this so that we can be able to control the animal diseases. They were trained for another one week on community-based affairs and they managed to cascade the same information at the lowest level, that is the sub-county level. As I said at the beginning, community health strategy has uh, several levels. We have the community level, the sub-county level, and the county level, which in Kenya we call the counties, in other places we can call them the districts. So the master trainers cascaded the information to the county people who we recruited 20 people per sub-county. Each county could be having several sub-counties, but then given the data by the government, we decided to settle on one sub-county per county, depending on the severity of the cases identified by the government. So 20, about 20 people were trained per county who data cascaded the same information to the other kind I had explained of the community health volunteers. The project was able to support 725 volunteers and because the volunteers had not, the government did not have this system of the community-based surveillance, we agreed that we choose from the bigger population of the existing community health volunteers, we select only 700, 725, out of which, after making them understand the case definition of the epidemics, Remember, we talked of the 10 diseases. By that time, there were nine, sorry, I am saying 10 because of the current COVID-19, which had explained it, how it was integrated into the system. So we trained 258 after ensuring that the volunteers can be able to discuss diseases comfortably. They understood the simple case definitions. As, since these people are not technical, people just wanted them to understand the simple basics of how they can be reporting on the diseases without necessarily being forced to use technical words. So the 258 volunteers were selected again from the initial 723 had taken on the basic knowledge of the surveillance, how they could be able to report the cases and track the cases from the community. So you can see that this happened in the year July 29, so the program is still new in the country, but we are proud because the system has really worked for us. In the year, the same year, around August, all the counties had completed training, all the 205 and 58 volunteers because each country has its own timeline. And by March this year, we can successfully say that we're having the, the assistance, the, the volunteers are able to pick diseases and report. I'll also explain how they have been able to report using the system of the SMS and the COBOL tool. The, the, when 
we, we had the epidemic reported in the world about the COVID-19, we found Kenya was also in the, the countries in the statistics of the countries which have the epidemics of the COVID. And our first case was reported in March 2020. And moving with the speed, we appreciate International Federation of International Federation, that is IFRC, because they were able to support us and we were able to integrate the alert for the COVID-19 using the simple case definition again so that the volunteers could understand. And even now, the volunteers have been, the 723 volunteers have been sensitized about the COVID and the 258 are able to report for the same. So we can say this one is working for us and we hope that the system will continue and the government picks and, and adapts the system. What you can say, after we introduced the CPS, the government has been able to review its IDSI toolkit and they have integrated the CPS, but they have not launched that officially. The human alert I was talking about, R5, we talk of the case definition, Frontier can pick the case and report as severe water diarrhea. They are not technical people, but when they report using an SMS, a short, short SMS, which we write as star 384 hash 60, then they call the immediate supervisor because each, volunteer, each, each community unit has its own specific volunteers. And a group of volunteers in the community unit are being supervised by a, a supervisor. The, each volunteer was given a, a unique ID and a, a unique village then the supervisor can be able to get, is able to get the alert and follow up with the volunteers. So if a volunteer, if I can give a simple example, conducts a routine health, health education or household visit and comes across a, a, a community case, they suspect the canonist red star rate four hash 60 then call and send the SMS to the assigned supervisor who follows, who follows up the case and updates another to recall the combo. So when the volunteer sends the potential alert, the, the, the healthcare worker, remember initially we talked of the animal diseases and the human diseases. So the supervisor could be either a healthcare worker or a volunteer in this case. So if a volunteer picks an animal alert, he will send the, the alert to the immediate supervisor who is a, a, a veterinary officer assigned to that location. If it's a human alert, the volunteer will pick the case, decode, send the, the alert to the supervisor who decodes, and then uses various steps to follow up. We call it a system generated diagnosis, but the volunteers have no right to declare any if it's a, a breakdown of the an outbreak of disease, but the supervisor after decoding can always pick a phone and call the volunteer after recording the village ID at the village and the volunteer name and call them and confirm, is this what we are saying? Yes, as they feed the cobo. Then there's what we call the, the dashboard. The information is taken at the dashboard at, at the national level, at the county level, and even at the side of the partner. We can see that and it prompt an, an action, while the government also prompt or an action depending on the threshold of the case suspected. That's when they always follow up to ensure whether it's a, a, a case which requires immediate action. If it's a repeat case, for example, the, the supervisor can always follow with the county disease surveillance. They set the team on the ground to confirm they can kill the animal and take the animal head to the national laboratory or the county based laboratory. In the region, you have two laboratories, one in the central region and the other one in the Rift Valley region. And from there, the necessary actions are always taken. So you can see the partnership. We have the flow of information from the community to the supervisor, from the supervisor to the regional office, from the regional office to the national office. But this one is not purely about Kenya Red Cross, it's about the government partnership. And that's why we started this system to enhance what the, the government is already doing. So if the, the, I talked of the, the volunteers, each county, each county has a cluster of volunteers. For example, in Narok West, we have 206 volunteers who have been trained the epidemic control for volunteers. But out of these, we have about 50 who have been trained on, ECV, on CBS. 
it, these frontiers are distributed equally in the in the county. For example, the 206 frontiers are uh, are scattered across the 123 villages. In West Pokot, we have 172 frontiers again trained, and they are spread across 148 villages. In the Rakanini, which is in the central region of Kenya province, we have 150 frontiers. And funny enough, the frontiers are few, but the, the villages are densely populated. So we have them distributed across 367 villages. And finally, the last county, which is Bomet, whereby we normally have so many animal cases, like Rebid and Andrax. The frontiers are distributed across 120 villages. So we can see that surveillance has really helped, us, helped the government and even us as a partner to be able to, to respond quickly for any reported cases, given that the frontiers have been taught the basic case definitions, they are well supported with the, the, with the right tools for reference information, and there's a functional system of them being supervised well by the government officers. Out of the, the surveillance we have been doing, I, we obtained a sample. For example, in the recent past, in the dashboard, after the frontier sent the ANAT and the CH and the supervisors were able to decode and send SMS, 121 ARATs were received. We will always have true or false ARATs. Remember, the frontiers are not technical people. They are still learning, although we keep reminding them on how to, to, to be accurate in case definitions to avoid making false alarms. In the last time, we realized that for this specific example, at least we had that 4% out of the cases reported. Out of the 121, that 4% was the correct, the true cases. The timelines for the actions is within 24 hours. After NARAT is sent, we always work in partnership to ensure that the response is done in timely manner and that if there is need to control the epidemics, it's done in the right way to the right people. Okay. The the other the the, the recent findings we have seen that sometimes they have challenges with the system. For example, in the fact that the volunteers are not able to send the zero reports. Every time they are supposed to, to ensure that the volunteers are still working, we ensure that they send the reports we call zero reports. This tells us the volunteer is still alive. There's somebody keeping guard in a certain village. And this one also is populated as the dashboard. So in the graph, you can see that sometimes the volunteer, if the system fails, will also be able to detect and take the right measures. Like in the recent past, we have realized one of the counties had a challenge because the system was not working, but we have worked and we have improved on the system and the volunteers are now able to send their rats. The other issue is about the, the accuracy and the, the COVID-19 has given us challenges, not only as a country, but even in the community level. You find that the volunteers have not been able to participate fully in the COVID because of the current situation. You should not, you should keep your distance. You should not visit closed households. So the volunteers also got scared and they reduced the number of community educations as well as the household visits. So this has given a fall in the number of the cases, fighting or even tracking, but Contrary to what you'd expect, they, they, they were able to have more, they were more accurate in reporting the cases as opposed to the other time when they conducted so many visits with, false, with so many false errors. The percentage, the accuracy has really improved. The other challenge we've had with the COVID-19 is that the resources, the community economic status were also affected. So you find the commitment of the volunteers has gone down since they would always want to support their refugees using other means. And as volunteers, we are not able to support them always. So the challenge, the other challenge is that the capacity of the laboratories, I talked of the three counties and it's only one lab which is supporting all the other counties. And you have to take a lot of time even to travel to that from one county to another. So it reduces the, the surveillance accuracy. The volunteers also, the demotivation, the livelihoods, the issue of the, the facility healthcare workers, 
they are they feel they are not part of the system because of the government in idea standard is in the integrated disease surveillance it has not include has not updated COVID-19 as a notifiable disease. So there's a, a, a lot of reluctance in the system at the F1 facilities, but we are still doing what we are able to do within our means. So the other challenge, maybe we can talk, which is not only with Kenya, is the PPEs. Sometimes you feel the volunteers may feel that the masks, they have managed to make their own mask, but sometimes they feel it's not enough. So they will just do the visit minimal to, the, to their resources and protection to ensure that they are also protected. We cannot just push them so much to do so many households as they, as they used to do before the COVID-19. So Thank I you, Naomi. That was wonderful. That's the much we can say about CBS in Kenya. Thank you. Um, so we're still having our colleague from uh, Somaliland, Red Crescent, is having a, a bit of technical issues uh, joining the call. So I'm just going to jump ahead to the next session and then hopefully uh, he will be able to join us uh, and present in a little bit. So one of the next things we wanted to do was really look through uh, some of the tools and guidance that already exist. So one of the first ones is the CBS assessment and sort of why knowing the, the surveillance lab landscape within a community is important before starting to do CBS. So why do we really want to do an assessment? You know, CBS is, is something that has gained a lot of attention recently, but it's not always the right approach in all contexts. And we need to recognize this and make sure we're not doing it somewhere where it's actually not going to be the answer to, to the problems we've been seeing. The assessment also helps us to identify surveillance systems that are already in place and to figure out what gaps might, all, might be within these systems. It helps us to define if CBS will be a good match for what these gaps are and if CBS is actually feasible for us to implement within the context. It also helps us to identify strengths and the capacity of national societies to be able to conduct CBS and to figure out specific areas within a CBS system where support may be needed to really implement this properly. So within the CBS assessment for COVID, what we're looking at really is a rapid assessment since we're in more of an emergency phase here. And we're really the key questions we're looking at, is CBS actually needed and relevant within this context? Does it match the mandate of the national society? Is it feasible? Are there already existing relationships with the Ministry of Health or other surveillance actors such as CBC? Uh, is there a capacity to respond from the Ministry of Health as well as from the national society? and to figure out what the suggested modalities of CBS would be within this. So when we look at CBS more largely in terms of a longer term program, whether it's preparedness CBS or a long term CBS program, this pulls from some of those key questions as well. So really looking at, because sometimes we see that there are gaps in a surveillance system and we think CBS would be something really good to implement, but it could be that the gap within a surveillance strategy is not that the, the information isn't coming from the community into a, into a local level health facility, the gap may be that that health facility doesn't have the ability to do an investigation to see if that actually is a confirmed case or not. The gap could also be lab capacity. Maybe they are taking, they can investigate and they're taking tons of samples, but they're not able to actually test and get laboratory confirmed cases. So these would be different gaps within a surveillance system overall that isn't functioning, but CBS would not help fill that gap. We could actually be making that gap worse by raising the expectations of a community, thinking they're gonna get fast reactions to something when in fact there's still no investigation or no follow-up from the Ministry of Health. So that's really one of the reasons to do this and ask these questions to make sure we're actually filling the gaps that exist within the system, making sure if we're going to bring this service and bring these alerts from the community level into a ministry system, uh, does the Ministry of Health have the ability to investigate these? And how can we best fit in within this system, making sure we're not overlapping too much with Ministry of Health and they're not feeling like Red Cross is taking over some of their traditional roles? Are there other partnerships that already exist? Is this something the National Society really wants to implement and would have the ability and capacity to continue implementing after a donor funded project is open? Uh, is over, sorry, and is it something as well Ministry of Health would like to invest in to build as well? Um, and uh, finally, one of the key questions is how would this CBS data be collected? Uh, what is the best way based on the surveillance system of that country 
the demands of Ministry of Health, uh, the capacities for IM within the national society to really manage this data and report on it as well. So for all these questions we're asking, where can we find this information? So there's a ton of places to look really in existing documents. These could be through joint external evaluation reports that are done by Ministry of Health and WHO. Uh, Ministry of Health, if they have an existing community health strategy, uh, some often already have community-based surveillance strategies or they have EBS strategies. Uh, they may also have IDSR strategies for the most part in Africa, they will have that. So pulling from these documents and seeing what already exists and if there is a gap, what we can see on paper, where do we think we could really fill a gap there as well. Making sure to discuss with our ministry focal points uh, and counterparts uh, in the surveillance offices at national district and local level. Same thing with national society at branch, HQ, and as well as with volunteers. Making sure we talk to the communities themselves. So bringing in volunteers, uh, bringing in community groups, community leaders, talking with existing community health volunteers and community health workers. And as well as our, if there are other partners already working in either community-based surveillance or event-based surveillance, uh, such as CDC, WHO, or other NGOs, making sure we talk to them to pull in the lessons they've learned as well to see how we can best fill existing gaps. So within this process, we're, the main questions we're really looking at is, is CBS needed? Uh, how would CBS fit within the current landscape? Is it feasible? And then from these, coming out with some clear recommendations would lead us to the decision of, is CBS something we should do or not? Uh, there are a quite a few examples I can think of where we have gone through the assessment and then decided actually CBS is not something we would move forward with, uh, either because the Ministry of Health does not have the ability to investigate alerts. Uh, there was one country where on average it took two months uh, to investigate an alert, which means we would not be filling a gap. Uh, other times there's actually other actors already doing it. Uh, so there's actually not that gap anymore. So something else is happening. So that's why it's really important to do this so that we're not sort of doing work that's unnecessary when we think we're filling a gap, but in reality, uh, we're not. Um, I'm just going to share another poll uh, because I know a lot of people mentioned that they were already doing uh, CBS. So what the thing we're going to ask now is it should be popping up on your screen soon, uh, is just around assessments in general. So before you started your CBS program, did you do a CBS assessment? Um, so either yes, no, not sure, or even if you're not doing CBS. Because sometimes it can take quite a lot of time uh, and it's often tempting to, to skip the step of doing the assessment, but it does give us some valuable information. All right, I can see some votes trickling in. We have 45, oh, 50% of people who have voted now. Maybe we've put some people to sleep already because it's getting a bit slower. All right, I'm gonna close it so we don't stay on here too long. Uh, yes. All right. So not everyone voted, but what we can see is that actually the majority of people have done uh, a CBS assessment before they started with 41%. 14% uh, aren't really sure, uh, and 10% did not do one, and with the remainder are not doing CBS. So that's great to see that uh, the majority have done it, to see that that's, that's what's been happening as well. And so one of the other tools after doing a CBS assessment is the CBS protocol itself. So this helps us to really define our system and structure and say how we're actually going to do CBS and what it looks like. So when we're developing this protocol, it really includes stuff around our project background, our project structure, roles and responsibilities, both within Red Cross, Red Crescent, as well as other partners such as Ministry of Health and WHO, who's in responsible for escalating an alert, who's responsible for investigating the alert, who's responsible for declaring if something is a case or not, uh, who's responsible for launching a vaccination campaign, uh, those sorts of roles and responsibilities. And then within what time frame? If we escalate an alert, of how, how long does a volunteer have to put an alert into the system? How long does a supervisor have to confirm if that matches a community case definition or not? And then once that goes to Ministry of Health, what is Ministry of Health committed to in terms of how long it'll take them to investigate this alert? 
Ideally, that should be within 24 hours, but sometimes ministries are overwhelmed and that doesn't happen. But at least if we set this out at the beginning, we know what we're all expecting of each other within this system. Setting up our data collection and management systems, how are we actually going to collect the data? Well, are we going to use mobile phones? Are we going to use SMS? Uh, are we going to use paper? Uh, are we going to use Excel to manage our data? Are we going to use the NIST platform? Uh, are we going to do everything manually on charts? It really depends on a context and a national society as well. Looking at if we're doing preparedness CBS implementation, so how will this go within regular programming? How do we make sure it's maintained within our regular health programming? And then how can we scale this up to be part of emergency CBS if we have an outbreak and then be able to scale it back down to regular preparedness CBS as well so that it moves within an epidemic curve. Making sure we set an activity plan and m and &E and our indicators and what are we actually really trying to do. So within these reporting methods, there are three main ones uh, that we are seeing so far across the region. Uh, and these are using the NIST platform, using Kobo or using paper. Um, so there's advantages and disadvantages to both. And a lot of it is based on what a national society would like to do, what Ministry of Health is comfortable with, um, and what the national society has the capacity to work with uh, if there is no more technical support uh, from partners coming in as well. Uh, so we may use paper in a situation where there's no real uh, phone network uh, and it's quite difficult to have that type of communication or mobile data, um, as well as if it's a Ministry of Health that really doesn't do anything electronically and everything is done on paper. So paper might be the best way uh, to make sure something is sustainable and easily understood and adapted and used by the Ministry of Health as well. Um, and this is fantastic in terms of the fact that it really does take all of the alerts that come in and there is automatic analysis, automatic alert notification, as well as being able to automatically share that information with Ministry of Health and they can log in and see all of that as well. Um, Kobo, uh, you will have to build your own database to really manage that, that data as well as have your own dashboard to do that analysis, which is what we have done with CP3 as NIST was not ready when, when CP3 started. And then just depending on ministries of health and their um, data protection laws and what they're most comfortable with will help define what would be the best system to use as well. And within the protocol, we also look at human resources, which is a huge consideration uh, that we have to take into account within this as well. So how many volunteers are we looking at? How many extra staff do we need to actually set up the system? How many supervisors are needed to su supervise the volunteers? How are we going to make sure that Red Cross supervisors and managers are linked up with ministry staff? As well as making sure that we have enough human resources in place to adequately have a, a system that has proper coverage. So in general, we would say there should be a one volunteer per 30 to 50 households to have adequate coverage. Then on top of that, you would have about one supervisor per 20 to 35 volunteers. So what is the population we actually want to cover and to cover this properly? How many volunteers and supervisors do we need to have to have proper coverage? So making sure that's built in uh, so that we're not overextending and saying, oh, we're going to cover two provinces. Uh, and then really when we look at it in terms of the number and the HR that has to go into it, it's just not feasible within a program budget. So making sure all of this is taken into account as we do that planning as well. So what happens when we go through this whole system and then our decision is and our recommendation is CBS actually isn't feasible or it's not something that will fill the gap that we've identified as part of our assessment. So it doesn't mean that early detection and early action programming isn't possible. There's other things we can do that are quite similar as well, especially building around the ECV toolkit. So making sure we really just use, we can do fantastic training using ECV and just putting on the addition of a community case definition with an informal referral system to Ministry of Health. This happens automatically in a lot of places without us actually tracking it as well. Making sure that within this, we're also focusing programming on early actions that can be taken at community level. So if a volunteer thinks they see uh, someone with COVID-19, what are the community, what are the action tools that they should be using within their community um, to protect their community? So what is the, advice they should be giving around hand washing, around uh, physical distancing, around masks, making sure all of that is really well known so that it can happen automatically. 
and then continuing with advocacy and dialogue with partners and especially with Ministry of Health in case the situation changes to really keep promoting it. And what we have seen um, in a couple of countries now already where the CBS assessment told us that CBS was not uh, something we could do at this point in time. Uh, by focusing on ECB and doing referrals to Ministry of Health at a local level, the local level of Ministry of Health then made a request at the national level for CBS uh, to be included and that is now in discussions. So it really does help build the case uh, that there is a need for CBS, but just making sure everything is in place and ministry is on board uh, before we do this as well. So what tools and guidance exists and where can we find them? A lot of things are on uh, the cbsrc.org website, which is hosted graciously by the Norwegian Red Cross. So there's a lot of things around the NIS uh, platform itself, some training materials, um, especially for uh, at both TOT level as well as volunteer level. And then as well as a lot of these, the guidance documents are all in here as well, such as the assessment template and the protocol template as well to help guide through the process of, of developing these documents. Um, yes, and also the, the guiding principles uh, is there as well, as well as some specific guidance for CBS for COVID-19 specifically. Uh, that guidance document is on that website as well. Uh, and there's also the COVID-19 health, help, help, health help desk. Uh, which has a bunch of facts for CBS, as well as the documents there as well. Um, one of the things uh, the CBS Technical Working Group is working on, uh, which will hopefully be ready soon, is an m and &E framework around CBS, so some standard uh, indicators uh, to measure performance and to measure success, uh, as well as program quality as well. Um, so that's where we are in terms of tools. I'm going to pass over to Rebecca. Hopefully, uh, if our if Somaliland Red Crescent has joined us, if not, she will be um, our presenter. <laughs> yeah, we're going to uh, try a very uh, super techie solution, which is I'm going to call in on WhatsApp and then share my screen, which I'm hoping will work. Let's see. Hi, Baladi. Hi. So you are uh, you're online with the webinar now. Yeah. You have to speak loud and clear so they can hear you. Yeah, you're on WhatsApp. Bronwyn, can you hear him okay? It's a bit distant. It's a bit distant. Okay. Let's see. Is it better now? Can we do it? Bronwyn, is it better? Yeah. I, yeah, we can we can understand. If anyone's having issues, just put it in the chat box and we'll try and, and figure out a better solution. Yeah. And Baledi, you'll have to speak uh, loud and clear. <laughs> All right, go ahead. I'm on your first slide, go ahead. Uh, to read and write. 
And I agree when we have a first meeting with community health uh, workers or the community health uh, committee and also community leaders, they identify uh, people who are capable to lead and right. Well, I'm uh, also willing to participate to be a volunteer for uh, for community based surveillance. After I identify it, I identify the general needs and uh, community volunteers. Then uh, we provide a training, and when I provide the training, and uh, the community volunteers they go back to their destinations, and then when they go back to their destinations again, we go there as uh, and linking what they have learned, and also the community elders, and also the community to work with the volunteers so that they can have the ability to report. Yeah. I'm very sorry to interrupt you. I'm getting some feedback that it's a bit difficult to hear you. Okay. So, do you... Yeah, I'm speaking loudly. Yeah. So, can you try to... Uh, I'm speaking loudly, but can you try to tell what you're Yeah, you're on speaker. I'm wondering, do you want me to present and then you can correct me if I say anything wrong? Should I go through your points and then you can correct me if I say anything wrong? Okay, okay. Okay, okay, I'll put you down. Sorry everyone for the slight uh, technical issue. Um, I'll try my best to, uh, to go through uh, the lady's points and then he'll, uh, he'll correct me if I say anything wrong. Um, so the way that CBS and NIS work together in Somaliland, uh, NIS is the, uh, the, CB, the CBS software that we went through earlier, where the volunteers send an SMS that goes into the NIS platform, um, that then sends automatic alerts and analysis to supervisors and Ministry of Health. So the way that it works is that um, Valeri and his team have uh, selected volunteers um, who are in their communities already who are uh, well known and who are generally already CBS volunteers. They provide them with um, training first, so they train them to recognize the, uh, the signs and symptoms of uh, uh, their uh, priority diseases, which at the moment is uh, suspected measles, which we use uh, fever and rash, um, suspected COVID-19, so cough and difficulty breathing, um, malnutrition, uh, acute diarrhea, um, and then unusual uh, or cluster of unusual illnesses to sort of pick up on, on anything else. Um, they train the volunteers on that. Then the community um, notifies the volunteer when, uh, when someone is sick. Um, the volunteers go to the community member and assess whether or not this, match, this matches community definition while also providing uh, first aid, community health messaging, that sort of thing. Then NIS uh, aggregates and analyzes the data. Um, and if enough reports come from a certain area or within a certain time frame, the Ministry of Health are automatically notified to respond. Um, so in Somaliland, they've been doing CBS for uh, two years. Um, well, I lost the lady, but uh, they've been doing CBS for, for two years using uh, Now What's NIS, which they then started using in February when it was uh, finalized. Prior to that, they were the most important partner for uh, testing and getting community feedback in building the platform. So they currently have uh, 200 trained volunteers who cover over 90 villages. Uh, more volunteers are currently being trained uh, and they do their volunteer performance uh, mapping automatically through NIS. Uh, I'll come back to that a bit later. Uh, as mentioned, they report on suspected uh, diarrhea, measles, COVID-19, malnutrition and unusual events. Uh, and then the different health risks have uh, different thresholds. So that means that if there's uh, one report from a volunteer on fever and rash, uh, which could indicate suspected measles, um, then an automatic alert is sent to the Ministry of Health, whereas for diarrhea, uh, the threshold is higher as a certain amount of diarrhea is normal in the population. 
Um, so since February, they've had uh, 90 alerts that have been uh, automatically escalated to the Ministry of Health for response, um, 40 of which were for cough and difficulty breathing, uh, 34 of those were escalated. So CBS has been, uh, actually sorry, so escalation means that um, the supervisor of the volunteer has gone, called the volunteer, checked if it matches community case definition, uh, and then sent it to the Ministry of Health. Um, the reason that we have this extra check is to make sure that the um, Ministry of Health aren't getting accidental alerts, aren't getting um, potential alerts that, uh, that they've already been alerted to, that sort of thing. So there's just an extra level, level, level of checking in case the volunteer has made a mistake. Um, so one of the really cool things that's happened um, is that through CBS, uh, the Somali Red Crescent Society were able to detect uh, the first case of COVID-19 in Somaliland. So I'll just take you through how that happened. Um, the reason I say that that's a good thing is because by detecting it early, which is what we were saying earlier as well, by detecting it early, we're ensuring that um, uh, that the response can also happen earlier and that we're then li limiting community transmission. Um, so uh, in the beginning of March, uh, SRCS trained 131 CBS volunteers who were already reporting on other symptoms uh, to recognize signs and symptoms of potential COVID-19. So it's the community case definition that we showed you earlier. Um, what happened was that as soon as COVID-19 sort of started spreading globally, uh, the Somali Red Crescent Society did a really great job and quickly adapted um, their, um, their project to include these signs and symptoms, which is a, a very sort of key way to understand how their CBS project is so well structured, their volunteers are already trained, and then adding that additional health risk for our preparedness um, was quite easy. So then a few weeks later on March 26th, one of the volunteers detected a fellow community member uh, with cough and fever and difficulty breathing. Um, now this person in this community was in a place, uh, sort of, of um, what do you call it, a rural place in Somaliland uh, without any, uh, any existing cases of COVID-19, right? Um, she then uh, visited the person um, keeping social distance, that sort of thing, of course, and confirmed that the symptoms matched COVID-19. Um, she also then learned that the sick person had recently returned from, from London, uh, which then added to, which was a hotspot at the time, so that added to her suspicion. So she reported it uh, to NIS via SMS at 6 p.m. NIS automatically triggered an alert to the volunteer's supervisor. So the supervisor gets an SMS that says, an alert has been triggered, you must cross-check this information. So this happened within seconds. And the supervisor goes straight in, cross-checks, and then escalates the alert to the Ministry of Health. And while this is happening in the space of half a minute, <laughs> Um, the, uh, the volunteer is supporting the community, providing key health messaging uh, about social distancing, hand washing, that sort of thing. Two hours later, so two hours after the volunteer realized that someone is unwell in the community, um, the Ministry of Health sent a rapid assessment team. Um, and with the distance, that's pretty much immediately. Um, they asked the person to isolate at home uh, and then tested for COVID-19 the next morning as they didn't have uh, the means to test while they were there. Um, the tests were sent to Nairobi and so on March 31st it was uh, confirmed that the person tested positive for COVID-19 and was therefore one of the first people um, in, the, um, in the country who had uh, who got COVID-19. Um, and since then, the volunteers have continued to support their communities. Uh, they report symptoms and other health risks to NIST. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, about uh, 36 alerts have been escalated to the Ministry of Health. So by having this sort of quick alert system from the volunteers, we're filling the gap in the surveillance. Um, and we can ensure that response happens quickly, both at community level and from the Ministry of Health, uh, thereby limiting community transmission. So as uh, mentioned already, SRCS used uh, NIS. Um, 
there are some sort of uh, benefits of using using this that they wanted to highlight. So one is that uh, they can very easily understand and interpret the SMS reports that come from the volunteers and share this information with the Ministry of Health. So the pictures that you can see are um, pictures of their dashboard, which is the first thing they see when they log into uh, NIST, which then analyzes all the data for them. Um, and the Ministry of Health also have access to this page. So this page has no personal data, but they can all go in and track. Um, if the number of SMS reports go over a threshold that they set, um, so that's a, an algorithm based on number of reports in a certain time frame in a certain distance of each other that they set together with the Ministry of Health, then an automatic alert is triggered. Um, but it's, they don't need to cross-check all the other reports. So they can uh, watch the dashboard, see what's happening um, without it being um, very labor intensive, so to speak. Um, they can easily track volunteer performance. Uh, so it'll tell them on a map uh, and in this diagram how long it is since the last report, whether they're reporting correctly. Uh, reporting correctly means that they've sent an activity report to indicate that they are active or a, uh, a health risk report within seven days. Um, so they can quite easily monitor uh, how the volunteers are doing, which areas do they need to retrain, that sort of thing. And then they can also automatically um, trigger alerts and, and escalate them to the Ministry of Health. Um, just uh, at, the, at the end, uh, a few challenges um, that they wanted to, to highlight to the group. Um, there have been some uh, challenges with the Ministry of Health uh, about data security, uh, server location. So at the moment, all the data is stored in the cloud. Uh, which the ministry would rather have it um, uh, in local servers, which then limits the amount of uh, functionality updates that the Norwegian Red Cross can, can um, provide. Um, there have been some discussions about that and then some discussions about who can access the data. Um, a lot of this has been uh, answered through the, the new NIST platform that I mentioned was launched in February. So they can now, uh, the Ministry of Health can now log in and, and see all the data, which then helps. Um, CBS is, or it was a new concept in Somaliland. Um, it's on a voluntary basis uh, towards the Ministry of Health. So for uh, other health information systems, so facility-based, uh, HMIS, DHS2, um, WHO and other NGOs support the Ministry of Health. Uh, financially, which uh, we don't do and the SLCS don't do. Um, so selling it in has been a bit tricky, although um, that hurdle has somewhat been overcome, I believe. Um, motivation for uh, volunteers. Uh, I believe that this is on, and the, the lead can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that this is on uh, volunteer incentives. So the volunteers uh, don't get incentives for every report they send or every day. They get it when they do structured activities, which uh, is to say when they do uh, health promotion training that's over a certain amount of hours. Um, and I know that uh, there are some other organizations who have been paying incentives to volunteers and then that's been, um, been a challenge. Um, for COVID-19 specifically, um, Ministry of Health previously lacked the capacity to, to test. Um, it says also for measles. Um, and that in some rural communities that are really far away from the health facilities, it's been, it's been difficult to refer the cases to, um, to specifically if they need isolation. So home isolation has been, um, has been the answer there. Um, and then it says cost of trainings. I think uh, what's meant there is that uh, this year they've had uh, refresher trainings for all their volunteers. Um, they've also had uh, trainings for COVID-19 uh, that obviously comes with a cost. So that was everything from Baledi. Um, Baledi, is there anything else you want me to add or you want to add? I will take that as a no. 
So in that case, perhaps uh, we should go to some questions. Um, let's see. Uh, I know there were some questions in the chat. Uh, Bronwyn, do you want to answer the first question from Sylvia? Yes, sorry, it was just playing around. Before we go to the questions, just before we, we start on that, I, we had one last poll that I forgot to launch oh, yes. um, at the last, in the last section. So we'll just do that now, uh, and then we'll come right back into the questions. Uh, so our last poll was just a question around um, what kind of assistance or support um, might be needed if CBS is something you would like to do, or even if you're already doing it, are there other, other is there, other areas where you would like some support. Uh, so this is multiple choice. You can choose uh, as many as you would like, uh, just in terms of whether it's assessment or with a strategy or protocol, uh, if it's with advocacy, if it's for funding, if it's training materials, um, if it's something else, uh, if there's no assistance needed, uh, if you're not sure, or even if you're not looking at doing CBS, uh, where would you be? in that area. Sorry, just pulling up the screen again. So we've only had 14 people respond. So I'm just gonna leave that up for now and hope people keep uh, responding because that helps us as well in terms of where there's gaps or things that uh, we can help with from our side as well. Um, so yes, one of the first questions that we had was from Sylvia. Sorry, I'm just trying to pull it up uh, at the moment. My computer is not cooperating with me. Um, so Sylvia was asking, in the current context of high numbers of asymptomatic cases, there is a need to modify the community case definition to incorporate all contacts. Is this already being done? Um, so actually, WHO has started some, some global uh, discussions around redefining the case definition in general, as well as the community case definition. Uh, so these conversations have been going on uh, in Geneva, um, which we have been able to feed into with some of the national societies giving input as well. Uh, it doesn't look like it'll change too, too much, which just maybe just the addition of a few other symptoms, uh, things around uh, fatigue, maybe nausea, um, and muscle aches and that kind of stuff that have been seen to be quite common. Uh, the concern around this is that maybe this then community case definition gets a lot more confused with malaria, uh, which is something they're still looking into as well. But either way, you're still signaling something to the Ministry of Health and then they decide if it's a case and what it is a case of. So either way, signaling something is, is good, a good thing. Um, but in general, asymptomatic cases wouldn't be caught by CBS because there's no symptom or anything really to report on. And so if someone is a contact of a confirmed case, they would be picked up via the contact tracing system, which is the proper way to pick up those people who are contacts of cases anyway. But in terms of asymptomatic, it's nothing that would get picked up by CBS because CBS either needs to have some sort of syndromic uh, component or an event component to really be um, something that can be pulled into that system. So hopefully the asymptomatics, if they are contacts, they should be picked up via the contact tracing system. Otherwise, just having something as a contact, as a, um, a referral or an alert trigger, um, it's a bit vague uh, and we're it, it goes into a bit of other territory that veers a bit away from CBS, which is looking at unusual health events uh, with, within a community. Uh, there's also some, you know, still debate going on around the whole asymptomatic uh, definitions as well, um, with WHO a bit going back and forth on what they've been saying. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of clarity around whether when someone's talking about asymptomatic, if they mean asymptomatic really, or if it's just pre-symptomatic, as there hasn't been a lot of follow-up on people, they've just done it at the time of testing. So that's a whole other debate. But for the CBS definition, um, asymptomatic would not be captured under CBS, hopefully under contact tracing. Uh, I hope that answers that, uh, Sylvia, from what we've seen so far. Oh, I see a lot of questions coming in. And I'm just gonna end the polling. Um, and then everyone can see what has come up in terms of that. Um, so yes, assistance with training materials looks to be number one. 
uh, followed by support with developing CBS strategies and protocols. Uh, funding. I'm surprised that wasn't number one. I thought that was going to be number one. Um, and then we have the assessment and advocacy around CBS. So that's great. And so these are things that can really feed into a lot of the support that's coming out around CBS now and can help prioritize uh, some of the, the tasks that are going around within the, the CBS technical working group as well. Mm -hmm. And just encourage everyone again to go on to cbsrc.org slash resources because there are full training materials there, TOTs, TOVs, and you can sort of pick and choose the modules that, that suit your context. There really is uh, a lot of information there also on the assessment and uh, strategy protocol side. So, next question uh, is from uh, Marina on uh, CEA. So, I'm wondering if maybe Naomi could um, touch upon that, as I understand that you work a lot on the community engagement side of things. Um, so, the question is if you can comment on how CBS links to our CEA way of working, where communities become more involved in recognizing their health and disease situation, action, prevention, uh, also perhaps accountability to help facility staff. Naomi, do you want to attack that? Is Naomi dropped out? Maybe. Maybe she has. Okay. Okay. I'll uh, hand that to you then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, I think yeah, it does. There's tons of overlap between CBS and CEA, and we've tried to be really conscious of of making sure that that community engagement component is really one of the core elements with within CBS, uh, because there has to be that community buy-in. Uh, in order for communities to trust the system to be able to report into it. Uh, so really empowering communities themselves to recognize what uh, disease or health risks would be, when they should report things and where they should report things, as well as what they can do early on to protect themselves. So if you have diarrhea, hand washing, that would be one of your number one things to promote within a community. Um, making sure community knows if we're around COVID right now, really why social distancing is important and if that's not possible what are other steps that can be taken how to wear masks properly uh, uh, and those sorts of things as well um, so really trying to build this in uh, and making sure there's a mechanism for these communities to be able to also feed back on the on the cbs system and community health structures in general as well so that we can improve the systems uh, as we go on so some of this could be through really making sure that um, feedback systems are also incorporated as a way to uh, within CBS. It's something we've been trying to do and we haven't done it to the extent we would like to do yet. Um, we have a couple of proposals that we've been working on with the CEA unit uh, in the region to really try and take the learnings that have come out of Ebola with especially around the community feedback mechanism um, and how we can sort of scale that down into a bit of a smaller model and how we can incorporate that into CBS as well. Um, so there's a couple of things we've been looking at around that. Um, and it was one of the things we had prioritized for this year uh, and then COVID threw everyone for a loop. Uh, but it is something we would really like to look at more, especially on that accountability side, because we really tried to bring in that community participation, but we haven't really sort of closed that feedback loop yet to really make sure that the system is addressing what the communities want and it, it's doing what they need. So I think it's a, it's a lot of a work in progress. And I don't know if Eva is still on the call. Uh, I know she was here earlier. Uh, sorry to put you on the spot, Eva, if you're still here. Um, but if you had any thoughts around that as well, that would be fantastic. Hi, yes, I'm, I'm still on the call, but I can actually just echo what, what you said from Winded. It's, um, yeah, we, we've had a lot of discussions. It's extremely closely, closely linked and there are lots of opportunities to um, to use, to set up community feedback mechanisms to strengthen that component, to make sure that all the information um, that, that volunteers are receiving is uh, tracked in a systematic way and then can easily share it with 
uh, with decision makers, with the different um, stakeholders, it, it should be um, shared with. So actually, yeah, I can just repeat what, what you said. For those of you who don't know Eva, she is the CEA and emergencies delegate for the Africa region with IFRC. Sorry, that's why I pulled her in on that one. <laughs> Hi, everyone. And thanks, Brendan. <laughs> thanks, Eva. All right. Thanks, both of you. Um, I think the next question was from uh, George asking if the NIST CBS data for Somaliland is analyzed together with HMIS data to fully understand the context of the situation in the community? Um, yes, there are sort of two answers to that. Uh, I still have the lady on WhatsApp, so the lady will correct me if I say anything wrong. Um, one is that uh, we're working on currently with NIST, and this is quite sort of in the pipeline uh, for in full integration or some integration um, with health information systems in facilities, specifically uh, the HAS2 and potentially EWAS. So that is uh, coming. For the time being, uh, the way that it works in Somaliland is that the Ministry of Health have access to the community data. They have uh, weekly meetings and weekly reporting to the Ministry of Health showing all the community data. Um, and quite often during uh, outbreaks, they'll then share data more often and meet more often to, to compare really and to look at what is happening in communities and can we see that echoing in facilities um, to get that uh, context in the country that you're, that you're talking about. Um, for instance, um, summer, so June or July last year, there was a, an E. coli outbreak in one of the regions in Somaliland um, that the Ministry of Health were alerted to because of uh, CBS, and they could then make sure that they had uh, the capacity to um, receive those people uh, at the local hospital. And then when we looked at the, the data from HMIS and CBS, you can see the sort of same, same curves. Um, obviously, because a lot of the people that we get from CBS data are then going to the health facility, so they are then being counted there. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, Bronwyn, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm just going to jump. I, there was a question from Jerry around how do we go about data control in a country without that does not have a data control policy. Uh, despite having a good collaboration with the government. Um, so is, is the question here just around if, if the ministry itself doesn't have anything in terms of data protection, if they don't have a policy? Uh, Jerry, is that it? I just want to make sure I fully understood uh, before launching into some thing. Yes, please. Go ahead. That, that's okay. exactly what I mean. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I think Really for this, uh, a lot of context, a lot of countries that we have in Africa, the data protection uh, is not strong and it's not something ministries really um, enforce. Uh, and there's a lot of sharing of data that is sensitive that should not be shared. Uh, so in this respect, what we do is we would go with what would be uh, best practice and following the IFRC data protection policies, especially in terms of sensitive data and what is shared. Uh, so some of this, both through Kobo as well as through through NIS, personal data is never is not shared. Um, so that kind, but the aggregated data um, and some of the raw data without some of the identifying information uh, can be shared with Ministry of Health. So if the Ministry of Health does not have any data protection policies, we would go with the default of what it is for IFRC, um, at least for a federation project. Um, so that there is some sort of data control and data management and protection going. Uh, that is, you know, it, applicable for that for that program and for that data. Um, what we do run into sometimes is that ministries of health have very stringent uh, data protection or data uh, management policies in place, where it can sometimes get a lot more tricky, um, especially in terms of, as Rebecca was mentioning, where data is hosted. So if it's hosted on a cloud, but the ministry is insistent that it has to be on their servers, uh, then that comes into some negotiation about how we can best um, still have access to that data so that it works on the platforms and the structures that we have built uh, to be able to do the analysis. And so that data does still also belong to Ministry of Health as it should because it's coming from their country. Uh, but making sure if they don't have any data protection in place that we can at least put 
um, what we have as our best practice in place to, to put some sort of um, control onto that as well. I can also uh, maybe add from the NIST side that so for NIST it's uh, GDPR compliance and so there is no personal data that is shared um, and that in our experience um, when you explain that to the Ministry of Health and explain why we're not sharing the personal data it's been uh, it's been okay I think even when they've when it's been in context where they haven't had the laws they've still sort of understood the, the logic of it and been on board with it. So. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. I'm cognizant that we have, we're over our allotted time uh, and there's still questions coming in, um, but I know people have a lot of meetings. So what we will do is we will try to address some of the outstanding things, um, maybe in a follow-up email. Uh, if there is interest in any sort of follow-up or other parts of within CBS, um, but within, I guess, um, something like a more detailed component, if you want to look at something within CBS in more detail, so whether it's an assessment, whether it is uh, reporting structures, whether it's the NIST platform, uh, whether it's developing uh, a protocol, those sorts of things, let us know and then we can look at doing something more detailed on different components as well, depending on where needs are. Um, so for that, you can reach out to either Rebecca or myself uh, and just let us know and we will figure out the best way to keep supporting uh, with CBS because I don't want to keep everyone all day. Um, I just wanted to also say a very big thank you uh, to both Belidi who couldn't actually join us properly, um, but put together a wonderful presentation and has done fantastic stuff with Somaliland Red Crescent, uh, especially around COVID and picking up some of the first cases in country, and as well as Naomi, who has been a, a powerhouse with Kenya Red Cross as well, in keeping things going and supporting uh, and really rolling out, uh, COVID, you know, integrating COVID into a CBS system and delivering trainings uh, when travel is not always possible and with small group settings, and they've both done a fantastic job. Uh, so thank you both for presenting today. Uh, and, 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 and thank you, Bronwyn. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Anything else you wanted to add, Rebecca? No, I think that's good. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or clarifications later on. Yes. And Abel, I see the, the comment on French. And that is something we have also noted. And we're trying to figure out the best way uh, to have something in French as well. So we've not forgotten our Francophone national societies. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, do let us know if there's anything else. Have a wonderful day. And I'm just putting my email as well in the chat uh, if needed. Right. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.